Beware, traveler. We're going to talk about triggers and consent here. I'm going to allude to scenes of torture, breakups, parental issues, and edgy gamer boys. Throughout the video, I will be talking about Dungeons and Dragons, or games like it, collectively called tabletop role-playing games or TTRPGs. To be abundantly clear, this is not about consent, as it relates to sexual situations outside the game table. This is about a fantasy dungeon, not, well, a fantasy dungeon. You will hear me refer to players and characters. A player is the real-life person out of game making a silly voice and rolling dice. A character is the fantasy avatar swinging swords and casting spells within their in-game world. The dungeon master or DM is the one interpreting dice rolls, playing NPCs, that's non-player characters, and bringing the players to the table. Sometimes, players and DMs meet up at their local game store, which I'll call an LGS. There, you are adequately informed of the traps and lingo ahead. Now proceed through the dungeon, if you so desire. I want to talk about this important topic, and there's a reason why I have to explain why it matters, even though some of you are already nodding your heads. In my job working as a board game store employee and a board game cafe game master, as well as in my downtime as a dungeon master, fantasy enjoyer, and person aware of the internet, uh, let me tell you, I have encountered people who are very upset at being told they should probably practice safety and consent in their fantasy number cube imagination time. These are not straw men. These are real people who I think have every right to play D&D and other tabletop RPGs because I think anyone should feel free to try it out if they want to. This topic is so important to me because I have also talked to friends and read forum posts from strangers who have been pushed out of the hobby or turned away because a DM, player, or even an LGS was not practicing safe roleplaying. I do not want that, and you shouldn't either. This game and this community are better when we welcome more people into the hobby and help them start their journey rather than tell them, this is not for you. For those of you who have never played D&D because you're afraid of the cultish, satanic, uh, Stranger Things times you've heard rumors about, uh, I hope this serves as a good intro on how you can find the right group and be safe with them. Yes, the game will inherently have some swords and sorcery in it, but that doesn't mean it needs cults, beheadings, cannibalism, and all that jazz. In my career as a professional DM, I ran R-rated games for 50-year-olds and PG games for 8-year-olds, and it all works if you respect everyone at the table. For those of you who are TTRPG veterans and who already know that consent matters in your games, thank you for clicking anyway. Some of this will feel like preaching to the choir, but I hope this little summary will help you contextualize and validate why this is important for your table so that you are better equipped to explain it yourself. Last, and maybe most importantly, I know that there are folks out there who don't think it's important, who balk at the idea of consent being discussed at the D&D table. Let me go ahead and say, I'm here to talk to you too, and I'm not here to talk down to you. Sincerely, thank you for clicking on this video on a topic they may bug you. I hope you can listen and take it from someone who has been in a similar mindset of not getting why sensitive people's feelings matter in a medieval fantasy dice game. Guys, for real, just hear me out. If you still feel the need to comment about your disagreement at the end, that's fine. I just want to thank you for listening to the whole video. Please continue to listen to what others in the outside world are trying to say. Uh, D&D is an innately social game. Anyone can play it, and I want you to be a part of it, too. Now then. Role-playing takes your brain to an interesting place. 
the experiences we encounter in-game through the perception and senses of our player characters will inevitably be compared to the collected senses and memories of your own real, complicated self. You may be someone who has role-played for years and can easily compartmentalize between what's real and what we are imagining at the table. Once upon a time, I thought that was me. I don't have the production value for a dramatic recreation, so let's use some magic cards. One night, I was playing session 20 or so of my crew's usual Wednesday night game. It was a campaign built from the foundations of the Princes of Apocalypse adventure, and through our DM's creative guidance, the four of us had really taken to our characters. Mine was the noble fire genasi bard of lawful morals teetering on the line of evil, Lady Calida Van Demian. In this session, recurring NPC Lord Erdilium Whisperwind was accompanying the party on the way to our next dungeon of elemental cultists to eradicate, his nobly tutored mind sharing with us the lore of the land and the enemies we would face. Erdilium was a longtime companion of Kalida, established in my backstory I discussed with the DM, and on this night, Erdelium took his backstory plot point to its next development. He got down on one knee, pulled out a magical ring of protection, and proposed a marriage to Lady Kalida. The noble alliances wished by their fathers be damned. This was true love. So, uh, I panicked. Uh, not my character, Kalida, but me, the player, Jackson, I was completely thrown out of the game as my mind short-circuited and my whole body began to succumb to cold pins and needles. Uh, I didn't know how to respond. For about a minute, I couldn't roleplay my character even though I desperately wanted to play the game and respond to this wonderfully done development by my DM, my DM, who I might add was quite theatrical with his voice and body language. Uh, he got down on one knee as if he was committing the act himself, and that's dedication. Uh, but I couldn't appreciate it. Why? Well, not a year before, I had been proposed to similarly in real life, and I said yes. That story is frankly not worth telling. Uh, to keep it short, by the time this D&D night transpired, I did not have a ring on my finger out of game. Uh, no one at the table knew these were dudes that I had met at a live-action roleplay and really jived with, but we weren't having deep conversations uh, about what I, you know, at the time considered a very minor personal tragedy, uh, not worth sharing with my D&D bros. Uh, now, one of these guys happened to be very emotionally intelligent and picked up on the fact that I was having a moment with the role-playing, and not the good kind. Come on. Ah! Where are you? Ah, I'm in a glass case of emotion! Uh, he sat down with me in the parking lot after the game. I told him about my prior engagement, and he said, Oh, uh, the DM shouldn't have put you through that. Uh, that was not a safe place to go to, and while I appreciate that sentiment and that moment of genuine bonding and support to this day, I still agree with what I responded with, it's okay, he didn't know. My DM had no idea of this potentially triggering event because we hadn't talked about it. Uh, and I mean triggering in the sense of the very real, factual psychology that people with or without post-traumatic stress disorder can experience, not the memeified, uh, lol, you triggered, bro, uh, sense that we have watered it down to. Uh, if we had a conversation about our real-life fears and stresses, me and the DM, before the game started, if we had had to talk about boundaries of playing an in-game Bioware-like romance before ever role-playing it, uh, if the DM and I had hung out and gotten to know each other as people better, this little freak-out and total break in an otherwise amazing role-playing session could have been avoided. And that, folks, is really what consent comes down to. Just talk to your friends. If they're not really your friends, you can still have a one-minute pregame with your ragtag LGS crew you met through a meetup app. If you're a professional DM, you really should share some emails with your pay-to-play clients who have professional expectations of the experience you provide. Role-playing can be a powerful tool for examining issues that are very real, and it's very possible for anyone's brain to be overwhelmed when something gets too real. Oh.
maybe saying, yeah, exactly. Role playing lets us encounter our fears in a way that can let us overcome them. Some of you may even be so woke as to tell me, yes, D and D is currently being used in prisons and in therapy to deal with serious emotional trauma with the added safe distance of a fantasy world and a make believe character. So why not Leroy Jenkins your way into uncomfortable territory? Why sanitize your game? Why not use your game as an avenue to connect with your friends? For example, how about that one D&D episode of the IT crowd where Roy was also recovering some relationship baggage, okay? Let, let's take a look at that. Here we go. What do you want? It was not easy for me to come here, Dark Harden. It's sad, man. They've got real emotion at the table. one thing I felt I needed to say to you. Goodbye. And everybody cries. This is actually a lot like Critical Role. Yeah. The table's affected. So, bear with me. I love the IT crowd. This scene is hilarious, and I'm not about to criticize a mid-2000s comedy show for not adapting to 2020s sensibilities, but if you are using this scene as a defense for why you don't need consent in your game, or even as a blueprint, as I 100% have her dudes talk about doing, I think you're confusing a situational comedy for real-life pain. So let's pretend for a second that you've decided to take this fictional cue and incorporate Moss's method at your real-life D&D table. Let's rewind and break it down. Hello, Dark Harden. Hello. You guys are super funny. there. Tis I, Queen Eliza Eldritch of the Elves, who cruelly jilted you not three moons ago. Uh, it's because his girlfriend in real life jilted him three moons ago. do this. Sweet. So Moss incorporates a romantic element into the game. Roy notices that this situation mirrors his own recent breakup and it becomes too real. Uh, once this realization crosses Roy's face, great comedic acting from Chris O'Dowd, by the way, he says, don't do this, right? Just go with it, Roy. Okay, Roy has set a boundary and asked for it not to be crossed. Moss, if this was real and not a comedy show for our geekly, giggling enjoyment, uh, should take the mature call as the DM and halt the scene. Yes, this means he'll have to improvise something else for Queen Eliza Eldritch to say, but DMs have to do this all the time for the unexpected die rolls. Real ones know, if you can respect a number cube, you can respect human emotions, okay? Is this what Moss does? No. He says, just go with it, and the scene plays out. On TV, this is super funny, but unfortunately, I have heard of experiences like this playing out in real gaming tables, and it's not nearly as funny. This can break your game, break your party, and break friendships. When your players set a boundary and you intentionally cross it, you have shown them a fundamental lack of respect, my guy. The rest of your players or paying clients, if you've been a pro DM hustle like me, will see this red flag and know that you won't respect their wishes if they tell you they prefer not to indulge in torture scenes. Not to have an NPC child killed in a scene because they're a parent and we respect that in this house, or to just leave romantic subplots out entirely. Like, I got enough of relationship drama, I'm slaying in real life, bro. I do not need that when I am slaying dragons. Uh, if you want to play out this scene in a healthy way with your bros, just go to your boy who's feeling down and say, Hey man, we miss you. Let's work through your breakup at D&D. You in? And if he says, Yeah man, that could be weird, but let's try it, then go for it. All I'm saying, when your players set a boundary, don't cross it. Otherwise, you, my friend, may find yourself without players, and that's going to be on you. So an official 5th edition D&D sourcebook called Tasha's Cauldron of Everything lays out guidelines for consent in a simple manner. The game's designers recommend discussing hard and soft limits during session zero. It doesn't have to be an open conversation with everyone shouting their deepest insecurities out loud to a party of friends and strangers. 
there's recommendations that players have a private chat with the DM or anonymously pass along note cards of things they don't want to appear in the game. If you're looking for guidance on how to start incorporating consent at your table, reading this section of Tasha's is a great start. Tasha continues, Any in-game topic or theme that makes a member of the gaming group feel unsafe or uncomfortable should be avoided. If a topic or theme makes one or more players nervous, but they give you consent to include it in-game, incorporating it should be handled with care, and you must be ready to veer away from such topics and themes quickly. That last part is very important. If everyone agrees that something like a torture scene is fine as long as it doesn't go too far, then go ahead and let your Ramsey Bolton flag fly. If everyone is having a good time, then it's all good. But once a player says, uh, hold up, or too far, or wait in the eyes, or okay, that's just gross, be ready to set that flag at half mass while you move on to the party's daring escape or time skip to Two years of suffering later. Good job! You did it! You got to play a villain doing some messed up stuff, your players were down, and while their ironborn rogue will never be the same, the players will come out of it just fine, and that's what matters, players, before the characters. Back to Tasha. Common in-game limits include, but are not limited to, themes or scenes of sex, exploitation, racial profiling, slavery, violence towards children and animals, gratuitous swearing, and intra-party romance. Common out-of-game limits include unwanted physical contact, dice-sharing, dice-throwing, shouting, vulgarity, rose-lawyering, distracting use of cell phones, and generally disrespectful behavior. Before I ever started having conversations about consent and safety at the table, me and my college buddies would absolutely talk about keeping dice on the table and keeping off your cell phones. This is something 99% of tables do without Tasha ever prompting you. You had a talk about the rules of the table, everyone agreed, and you respected boundaries. That's consent! You're already doing it. Now it's easier to apply that to your in-game interactions. Let me share one more story. Flash forward a few years, I'm in a new city DMing in a new D&D campaign for my new job at a local game store. I've made a point to run my own unique game that our customers can't buy in the pages of an adventure book. And to that end, I've encouraged my paying players to let me know if they have an idea to incorporate into the canon of the shared world and the shared story of our adventures. One player, who we'll call Dustin to keep the magic cards going, was enticed by this and told me he would like it if his young paladin could have aristocratic mother and father NPCs who would become entangled in the big bad incursion of tentacly aberration things. I thought this was a great addition, and I made Dustin's suggestion canon as the party journeyed to his hometown to investigate the aberrant presence there. Following a few developments and a near-deadly encounter with a roper in the family's dungeon, it became clear that the paladin's father was complicit in allowing the aberrations advance in order to deal with a rival guild that threatened the family's good fortune. This culminated in an intense scene with Dustin's paladin pleading with his father to see the error of his ways and his father helping stop the aberrations before this sordid business went any further. This, however, left the father at the mercy of the rival guards while his son and companions fought the boss aberration on the other side of the portal. When the paladin and his victorious companions returned, they found his father beaten within an inch of his life, his reputation destroyed, feebly coughing up blood that pooled between the hairs of his graying beard. <sighs> This was too much. I noticed Dustin was in distress, which was weird because I had narrated PG-13 violence to this group of adults before, and it had never been an issue. So something else was going on. Uh, I did my best to improvise a cliffhanger for the scene before calling for a five minute snack break. This gave me the chance to motion Dustin over to a quiet section of the store to have a one-on-one -on -one chat, which Dustin was eager and willing to have despite some uh, very real out-of-game tears. Uh, you see, Dustin didn't have the best relationship with his own real-life father. And he had inserted this vaguely villainous dad in PC. 
uh, with his own father in mind. We both saw the broken link in our communication immediately. Uh, Dustin never told me this was a real-life insert character, uh, not just a random idea for an NPC from his backstory. Uh, Dustin apologized to me, but I told him not to feel too bad, because this whole arc of the story existed because of the idea he was willing to bring to the table. I let him know his paladin's father was going to be okay, giving him some metagame information that would help put his mind at ease and bring Dustin back into the game. Uh, I asked Dustin if he was okay and if we could get back to the game. Uh, remembering the group was taking a snack break. Uh, I even said if he wasn't okay, he could bow out. I would tell everyone he got sick and I would arrange a refund for the night for him. Uh, so we're establishing a safe way out of the situation. Uh, if it's too much, Dustin said he was okay, and that more than anything, he wanted to get back to playing with this group that was starting to become real good friends, so you gotta know what's important to your players. Uh, before we walked back, I asked Dustin if he'd like a hug. He said no, he's just never one for hugs. I said, that's okay, because that's all consent is. If someone sets a boundary, don't cross it. If someone says it's all good, go ahead. And if someone suddenly realizes that things have gone too far, you slow it down for them. It's not because you don't want to break a law or because you care about Tasha's cauldron or even because you want the best D&D game possible. It's because you care about this person's good time. And I know that you care too. I know that you want your D&D &D game to be better because you clicked on this video to educate yourself and to hear someone else's perspective. Now, go hear your player's perspective. I can keep going with lots of good examples of how I use boundaries and consent in the professional space to keep running safe experiences, but I think you get it. All it takes is a little talking to build trust. You may still have random occurrences that come up that cause a serious trigger or a minor discomfort, but when you've already laid a foundation of trust, now it's a lot easier to take a pause, talk through it, and find a solution that keeps your players coming back to your table. What if you're not a DM and you just want to play D&D &D in a safe space? Well, that's valid. You deserve that. Yes, D&D &D is always going to have swords and imaginary blood and death and threats to our characters' minds and bodies, but there are ways to deliver those little thrills without trampling over your boundaries. Have a chat with your DM about incorporating a quick safety talk into your session. Use simple tools like X cards, Roll20 Whispers, or even my own preferred system of red, yellow, and green cards to show your DM that you're comfortable or uncomfortable with the roleplay without breaking character. Red means, hey, this is a hard limit, please stop. Yellow means, we're on a soft limit, take it slow. Green means, this is good, keep going. And what if you're tough as nails, nothing gets to you, sticks and stones may break your bones, but vicious mockery can never hurt you? Cool. That's a strength and I'm glad you recognize it in yourself. If you and some like-minded people want to play a no-holds-barred X-rated D&D game because everyone agrees and that's what you want, congratulations! You're still practicing consent even if you don't have color-coded cards at your table. More importantly, you've found the perfect group to play your fantasy dice game with and I'm happy for you. Most of my games in college were like this and we had a blast. Just be warned. If you are going to practice DMing as a professional, or host an adventure league game at your local game store, or turn on your looking for game switch online, then you need to accept that you will encounter people who don't have the same exact sensitivities or lack thereof that you do. If these players come to you seeking a good time, and halfway through you hurt them using D&D because you are pushing your idea of what a real hardcore fantasy story is, that is your fault. Do not ruin this wonderful game and what it can be just because you want to prove how hardcore you are. I'm telling you this because I've been there. I have alienated people through this game because I would rather show that I'm edgy than show that I'm an empathetic human being. And now I have burnt bridges that I can never repair. And I don't want that for you. 
run the game the way that you want to run it, but don't impose that onto others without at least being honest at the start and telling them this is how it's going to be. Now, if you let someone know that you run an anything goes grindhouse game and they can go along with that flow or they can not join, I'll be the one to defend you and say that's fine. You've paid the toll to the bank of consent by warning sensitive players ahead of time and they can make their own choices. There are others out there who want a game like you do and I hope you find each other because I just want everyone to have better games in this this game that is so much more than just a game for so many people, and I want you to have a better game no matter what version of better uh, you want to be. Did you get all that? Thank you for watching the whole video. I hope it was worth your time, especially if you are one of the folks I addressed at the start of the video who don't usually support talks like this, truly. Thank you for listening to someone else's perspective. I hope you keep doing that so you can figure out what's important to you and how you can be your true self. So, why does consent matter? Because role-playing is weird, and almost all of us have some subject matter that will get too real and stop us from having a good time. Because it's plain disrespectful to cross someone's personal boundaries once you know they're there. Knowing some of these personal boundaries will improve your game by telling you where you can go, and it will probably help you build your sense of community, which is not a bad thing at all. Because it's easy to do, and 5e's designers and plenty of other TTRPG supplements will show you how. Because when someone is having a bad time at the table, we should want to help them rather than alienate them. Because this will make your games better. This will make your bonds better. And it will make lasting memories of this game much better to look back on. Thank you so much. Give yourself advantage and have a nat 20 day.